Hakshafut is the general Hebrew word or term for witchcraft and the occult. That's the general term. A witch in Hebrew is called a makshef, makshef, and a war, uh, I'm sorry, makshefet is a female one, a makshefet is a female one, and a makshef is a male one, but we would call a warlock. Harry Potter is a makshef. November of last year, I began to receive something of an avalanche of emails and letters asking me about Harry Potter because so many Christian parents were confused. And the reason they were confused is there were actually Christian schools having little children read Harry Potter. I mean, so-called evangelical schools. In Great Britain, a major Christian magazine endorsed the book Harry Potter and gave it a favorable review and it was a respected Christian magazine. It initially had the endorsement of James Dobson. I normally don't see movies except on airplanes and on airplanes I normally put movies off within 10 minutes because they're too stupid. But wanting to do, I wasn't going to read a book for little kids about warlocks, but because I re received so much mail and email, I did something I normally wouldn't consider doing. I went to see the movie, and I wanted to just see what people were saying, and to give an informed opinion. I just didn't want to condemn something without seeing it, since I got so much email, I wanted to know what I was talking about. So I, I, I went to see the film in, in London. I was in London, England, and I went to see the film, and uh, it had biblical images, like a talking snake. Only in the Bible, of course, a talking snake is something evil. It's to do with spiritual seduction. In the movie, the boy talking to the serpent was good. It was positive. It had necromancy. Harry Potter was trying to communicate with his deceased parents through a looking glass. Educational psychologists know that the ages of five through nine are crucial in the formative development of, of a child. A child is very sensitive and impressionable at that age, and you can make impressions that will follow them the rest of their lives. This is one of the dangers of the school system. I only wish that more Christians had heeded the warnings of C.S. Lewis back in the 50s and early 60s. When he wrote about the abolition of man, and he foresaw the danger and the damage that school systems could and would do. Now, we know what's happened to the state school systems. Even in my day, in university, all biomedical education was predicated on Darwinian presupposition. They were treating theory and fiction as fact. Now, of course, increasingly in Britain, America, and elsewhere, Children are being taught homosexuality and bisexuality are alternative lifestyles. They're being taught into faith. There's a co-equal validity to all religions. The fact that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes but by me, doesn't matter. The fact that Moses called other gods Shadim demons, or Paul called them demonoid demons, doesn't matter. Hare Krishna, Allah, whatever it is, Rama, Sitra. Social engineering. That's the state schools. In theory, the Christian schools should be an alternative to it. And there are some good Christian schools, but there are some other Christian schools that are as bad and in some ways worse than the world. There were Christian schools that were blowing on children and putting children through the Toronto thing instead of teaching them. That was actually happening. The growth of a cult. My main problem is when a cult gets into the church, when it permeates the fabric of what should be the community of God on earth, when it infiltrates the Lord's people. With our ministry in Britain is uh, an Asian Christian. He's a minister, an evangelist from India, but he works in the Asian community, the very big Hindu and 
Sikh community in the outskirts of London. His name is Tom Chakko. Tom Chakko is an evangelist to Hindus and Sikhs, and he's from a Hindu background. And Tom Chakko, among, in addition to evangelizing Hindus and Muslims and teaching Westerners how to witness to Muslims, he does something very interesting. He explains how what you see happening in a lot of charismatic and Pentecostal churches, and he himself is a Pentecostal, as am I, he ex moderate ones, he explains how these things are what his people are saved out of, kundalini yoga. We, of course, have videos of people in Toronto and Pensacola doing the same things that the followers of Bhagwan Rajesh were doing in India at the same time. And, the, and you see the footage of the people in India doing it, and then you see the footage of the people in Toronto. It was the same thing. You know, the mind of the beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar, and the Bible was something demonic, and it was a judgment from God. These people were calling it the Holy Spirit. And Tom Chaka will explain to Westerners how New Age is increasingly coming into the church masquerading as biblical Pentecostalism or as biblical charismata. He will show you. He will show you clearly and directly. We've got people who, journalists from the London Observer, went to a, a Toronto meeting and began having this laughing hysterics. And she said, I'm glad Christians are awaking to the new age. This is the same thing that happened to me in India when I went to see a certain Swami to do an article on religion in India. Uh, she wasn't born again, she was not a Christian, she was an agnostic, but she was having the same experience, only she got the experience first in India from a Swami, but then she got the experience at a so-called church. The growth of the occult. We've warned for some time that true prophets in the Bible always give people the word, they point people to the word. The word being Hadavar Adonai in Hebrew and Hologos in Greek. Now, of course, we know Jesus is the word. He's the incarnate word. True prophets always pointed people to the word. False prophets always give people a word. When you see people going around in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, at Paradise Assemblies of God or Hillsong, one of these places where they have this, or Phil Pringle's place here in Sydney, I have a word for you, oh, the Lord gave me a word, I have a word. That is not prophecy, it is clairvoyance. That's not prophecy, it's clairvoyance. It has nothing to do with biblical prophecy. It's not how biblical prophecy has ever operated. It's clairvoyance. It is simply the occult getting into the church. Why do people fall down when they're blown on? Stage hypnotists do that. I've yet to see any of them do something a stage hypnotist can't do. But again, it happens in Eastern religions. It happens in Sufi Islam. It happens in Hinduism. It happens in New Age. Why does this happen? What's going on? It's hypnotic induction. Hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. What we increasingly see is the infiltration of the occult into the church calling itself Christianity, calling itself Charismata, calling itself Pentecostal, calling it the Holy Spirit. But whatever it is, it's none of those things when you examine it biblically. The subject of Moksha Fut. We can't stop the world from being the world. The world is filled with witchcraft, always has been. And in fact, it's gotten to the point now where there's been a tremendous, in England, a tremendous growth among teenagers of not only Satanism, but things like Wicca and, and, and witchcraft, where, the, where, where teenagers will dress in black and they'll do, do the ancient incantations from the, book of, from, the, from, from the Wicca books and they'll meet at Halloween and they'll have covens and all the rest of it. And this, this is growing quite rapidly. But in extreme cases, it's, it's been mixed with uh, heavy metal rock music and drugs and there's been suicide packs. In New Jersey, there was a suicide pact, and these kids killed each other. Or they killed themselves and each other. It's quite frightening when this happened. In Adelaide, Australia, a year ago, there was a club that had people who, young people, who were what known as goths. Goths is one of the phenomena that came after the punk movement, where they dress like characters from a Frankenstein movie or a Dracula movie where they put on, 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 on white makeup and black and red and these kind of features that they look like something out of a horror movie and they dress like this 
and they go to uh, clubs, and they have them in London and Amsterdam and so on, and Los Angeles, but uh, there was one in Adelaide. And they would go to these clubs, and they would get charged up into a frenzy. Now, of course, in my own background, I was the original people. We were the hippies. We did this stuff, mixing the drugs with the occult and so on, and, and, and rock music to have these kind of experiences. That's when I was born again. A lot of people were. I can understand some of what they're doing and why they do it. So there were these gods in Adelaide, and they practiced something called lycanthropy in this club. They practiced lycanthropy. Lycanthropy. You laugh at it, maybe I would laugh at it, but if you see the gods, some of them will actually go to dentists and have teeth made into fangs, and they'll get capped to have fangs. And they will bite each other's necks. It's part of the thing they do. When they get stoned, listen to the music. And they begin to imitate animals, especially werewolves, and they begin to howl. When, 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 the, when the music goes off and they're stoned, and they begin to, ooh, ooh, ooh. There was a famous disc jockey in America who used to mimic this. His name was Wolfman Jack in San Francisco. Hey, Wolfman Jack, KSA and Rock and Roll Radio, San Francisco, all right, ooh. I don't know, that was probably a forerunner or something, I don't know, but what this is disturbing is these people take it seriously. It's not harmless fun. It's, uh, some people take this lycanthropy seriously. Now, lycanthropy comes from Eastern Europe. It was the, were the werewolf cults of Eastern Europe. Okay. So, they howl like wolves in this club, these gods. They get stoned on drugs and all that, and then, then they begin howling. Ow, ow. Two of these people got saved. They'd been witnessed to for some time by some friends of theirs, and they became born-again Christians. They were born again. And somebody else took them to an Assemblies of God church in Adelaide called Paradise, which was the platform for Benny Hinn and promoting Benny Hinn and Rodney Howard Brown and the rest of it. And they went to this place, to the youth meeting. And what did they hear in the youth meeting? They heard, oh, oh. I watched a video that someone showed me in America of, with Kenneth Hagen and Kenneth Copeland, and he's hissing like a snake, <laughs> like that. And on it, there was a young woman. She looked like a she-wolf. She was imitating a she-wolf in heat. She had red hair and glasses. She's like, oh, 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 oh. These young people who were born again and saw themselves as having been being saved out of this stuff totally freaked out. Now we see the same thing in the church that we were saved out of. And <clears throat> somebody brought them to our meetings and they told us what happened. And, well, you've got lycanthropy among Magats, among these people who, who, who are in this drug scene. But now you have lycanthropy in the church. I've seen the videos. I believe those young people. I've seen videos of people doing it. Not at Paradise, but I certainly saw Hagen's people doing it. This is a cult. The mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I know it's God. I know it's God. Well, if it's God, he's angry at you. It's a judgment. You know what's amazing? The late deceiver and heretic John Wimber, he, uh, he said this stuff was of God. But the same things he was saying were of God, just a few years earlier, he was saying it was demonic and they needed deliverance. The same phenomena, when the same phenomena happened a few years earlier, it was demonic. Now, all of a sudden, it's the Holy Spirit. That was John Wimber. That's the kind of man he was. He was a man who was definitely a man who Satan used tremendously. I know a, he was a church growth consultant. He was paid up to $450 an hour to tell you how to grow a church. $450 American. Like nearly $1,000 an hour your money. I know a pastor who had gotten involved with this church growth stuff and then came out of it realizing it wasn't biblical. And he hired Wimber to tell him how to grow his church. And he told Wimber he was complaining about how some Christians had lax attitudes towards divorce and remarriage and how he was going to have to take a stand concerning this issue of divorce and remarriage. And Wimper told him, don't do that. It'll hurt your attendance figures. This is the kind of what you're dealing with. This is what you're dealing with. Doesn't matter if it's a cult. Doesn't matter if it's moral. Just matters numbers and money. That's what it comes to. These people are not running churches. They're running enterprises. 
They run on secular management and marketing principles. That's the whole Bill Hybels philosophy. That's the whole Peter Wagner philosophy. It's certainly the Robert Schuller philosophy. It comes from motivational psychology, from marketing, from management. In fact, that same mentality permeates the Alpha courses. It's to do with marketing, but it's not to do with New Testament Christianity in, 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 in a genuine biblical sense. So there was lycanthropy in your country. I saw lycanthropy on videos. I saw, I saw them doing it. Hagen was hissing at this woman, and she began, they began imitating wolves. I watched it. There has been a tremendous influx of the occult into the church in recent years, calling itself charismatic, but not resembling any biblical model of charismatic. We have to understand, in Hebrew, we have one general word for occult and witchcraft. That's makshafut. But there are different forms of it. The first word we have to learn in Hebrew is kesem. Kesem. Kesem is divination. It's when you use a ritual, an instrument, or a technique, or some combination of those things to make something happen spiritually or metaphysically. Kesem. It's when you use a technique, an instrument, a ritual, or some combination of those things to induce a spiritual result. Kesem. That's one word. Kashaf. Kashaf. Kashaf is the Hebrew term for sorcery. Sorcery. It comes from the book of Nahum. It's one of the places you'll find it. And of course, the wicked woman in the book of Revelation with the sorceries, that's just paraphrased from the Septuagint, from the Greek text of of the book of Nahum, from the Septuagint, from the Greek Old Testament text of Nahum. Kishaf. Kishaf. Like makshafut, same root. Okay? Keshaf, same root. Sorcery. Magic. Arts. Okay. Then we have another word. Yo di a i. This comes from the Hebrew infinitive of the Hebrew word la daat, meaning to know. To know. It is the word for wizardry in Hebrew. Wizardry. But it has the idea of being able to know. Being able to know. Okay. Now we have to understand the full implication of the concept of to know in Hebrew. To know. There are mysteries we are meant to know and mysteries we are not meant to know. And there are mysteries we are meant to know, but not yet. Mysterions. Mysterios would be the Greek. To know, ledaat. The Bible speaks in the Hebrew of sexual intercourse as to know. He knew this woman. The Greek is genasko. Joseph knew Mary. It means to know intimately. Sexual intercourse, for instance, in the Old Testament is described by, in Hebrew, as 
Niknas ba, Niknas ba, and he went into her. Okay. Now, of course, we're, some of you know this from our tapes. We are Maggio Dei beings. We're made in God's image and likeness. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Marriage is an outworking of us being made in his image and likeness. Okay, it demonstrates God's relationship with Israel and Christ with the church. It's a picture of Jesus going inside of the church, his bride, causing the church to be fruitful. Okay. So, Niknas Bahi went into her. One person goes inside of another person, and a third person is procreated. Okay? So it's one and three, three and one. It reflects the Trinity. You understand? It reflects our Maker. Okay? That is why, in occult practice, particularly initiations into witches' covens, if you've ever w w spoken to, heard the testimony of an ex-witch or Satanist, the induction rituals of initiation have to do with, with sex laying naked on an altar and being violated by the high priest. It's, it's, it's gross stuff. The initiation rituals into these witches' covens are sexually connotated, strongly sexually connotated, because it is, again, a satanic perversion of something good. Okay. To know. It's the same term for the high priest. Only the high priest on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was to, was to go into the Holy of Holies and know what it was like to stand in the presence of God. It was to be a mystery. Only he would go back of that curtain after he purified himself through an elaborate ritual, Lit Kadesh Betzmo. He had to sanctify or purify himself to go on back of that curtain. And of course, Hebrews tells us the high priest is a shadow or type of Christ. Okay. Now, any Jew could read the Torah and read what was inside the Holy of Holies. They could intellectually know that the Ark of the Covenant was in there. You know, they could read about the furniture, the lampstand, the showbread, the Decalogue, Aaron's rod. You could know what was in there. You could know. But only the high priest was to know what it was like to go in there. In Hebrew thought, biblical thought, there's a difference between to know and to know. You could know what was in there. You just read the Torah. But only the high priest was to know what it was like to go in there. And so you can get a copy of Gray's Book of Anatomy. You can look at fallopian tubes and ovarian tissue all day long. Anybody can know what's in there. But only the person sanctified was to know what it was like to go in there. The Hebrew word for a high priest being sanctified, mekudesh, was the same word for to wed. The husband is sanctified to the wife, the wife is sanctified to the husband. Only the person sanctified by God was to know what it was like to go into the Holy of Holies. And only the person sanctified by God was to know what it was like to go inside of his wife. Okay. Now, when you understand this, you understand the reasons for all the perverse sexual stuff involved in Satanism. It's not a pleasant subject. I only mention it to the degree we have to because it's an ugly thing to think about or even talk about. But that's what they do. Okay. To know. All occult, all occult activity counterfeits the gifts of the spirit in some way. I go to Africa a lot. I see Sangormas, witch doctors. Every one of them speaks in tongues. Every one. None of them don't. The Greeks had automatic speech. Pagan tongues. Spiritists do it. Mormons do it. Charismatic Catholics, so-called, pray in tongues to Mary. They call on spirits of the dead. This is a cult. Necromancy. A cult. Goes on. Gifts of miracles. There's a gift of miracles. But there's also people who can do supernatural things by demonic power. I was once in the bush in Indonesia, and the pagans were calling down the spirits, and they had these masks on that were like faces of dragons and they were grotesque faces and they were doing these crazy dances and as the beat intensified they became more and more out of control in what they were doing and I was told they're calling down the spirits and when the spirits manifested they began doing incredible things some of them began imitating orangutans which you've got orangutans in New Zealand and they have these coconuts, not like the coconuts you'd buy in a supermarket but they were about this tall and you had to hack them open with a machete they would just pick up these coconuts and rip them to shreds with their teeth as if they were an ape. Now, that's something that no human could do naturally. Some, uh, uh, certain apes can do it. <laughs> they began jumping like apes. 
I'd never seen anything like it. Until I got off the plane in London and went to Holy Trinity Brompton. <laughs> Not only did I see the monkey spirit, I saw the, the rooster spirit. <laughs> I saw the cocker spaniel spirit. I think this one dude had the platypus spirit. But I saw somebody in New Zealand when he did this. I'm not New Zealand, New, uh, New Zealand, Indonesia. He took a wedge of glass about the size of the palm of your hand, as if it was a biscuit, a cracker. It was not leger de mat, it was not a chicken, right in front of me like this. Showing me his teeth and chewed the glass to bits. No blood. Well, this is a satanic counterfeit of the gift of miracles. There is satanic power in this stuff. I saw it. Well, the same as you have counterfeits of tongues and counterfeits of miracles, you also have counterfeits of words of knowledge. Lada'at, to know. When you know something supernaturally that you can't know cognizantly or intellectually, it has to come from a supernatural source. Now, I'm not talking about that Arlen Popov guy, that Popov, Peter, sorry, Peter Popov, Peter Popov, who had his wife with the microphone out getting information on people at his meetings, and then she was beeping it up to him, and he was pretending it was words of knowledge. He's a con artist. And you know, he's back in ministry, and people will still go to him, even after he was exposed on TV, but they'll still go to him. They want to be deceived. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when somebody really does know something that they can't know intellectually. It can come from one of two places. It can come from the Holy Spirit. It can be a word of knowledge. Now, I've seen people have that gift. Uh, I've only displayed it a very few times in my Christian life. It's only happened to me a couple of times. There was one time in New York it happened, I remember. Um, there was a Jewish girl in a taxi cab, and I saw her, and I never saw her before. I didn't know anything about her, but I knew she was Jewish, partly from her features, partly because I just sensed it. And uh, I said to her, look, you're getting involved with a fortune teller. You're going to this fortune teller, and this person's getting you more and more in bondage to fortune telling the occult, and it's going to destroy you and kill you. And she freaked out, and I began telling her about this fortune teller. And I said, look, in the Torah it says God will condemn this as witchcraft and you need to accept Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and repent and accept the Messiah. Now, there was no way I could have known anything about her. I never saw her before. I've experienced the real thing, but it's only been once in a while. It's like the prophets of Israel. They only prophesied once in a while. Sometimes they would go years without a prophetic message. Most of the time they were pointing people to the Bible. You know, sometimes years before Daniel or Jeremiah would get another message, but when they got it, it was right. False prophets, witches, wizards, they'll always have a word, or they'll always have a picture, or they'll always be doing a miracle, you know, they'll always be doing it. You know? The counterfeits happen all the time. It's the real that tends to be less frequent in the Bible, okay? In, the real tends to be less frequent. Now, of course, Satan would only counterfeit something worth counterfeiting. If there was not a real, he wouldn't counterfeit it. Cessationism, the false belief that these gifts ended with the apostles, cannot be sustained from Scripture. It is a doctrinal error. It is as wrong on one extreme as is charismania on the other. There's a balance. Having said that, a wizard can know something not by the Holy Spirit. They would know it by what we call in Hebrew, ovot, ovot. Ovot in Hebrew are Familiar spirits. Familiar spirits. That's how they would know. The witch at Endor, she divined. Kesem is the word. But the way she was able to divine is she came in contact with her ovot, familiar spirits. Okay. And of course the sin there was necromancy, calling on spirits of the dead. When somebody dies, they've crossed the great divide between the finite and infinite, between the temporal and eternal. There is only one thing that can penetrate that divide. That's Jesus, because he was dead, now he's alive. Jesus acting through the Holy Spirit. You have one link with an unsaved loved one who was a Christian. You have one link. Until the resurrection and you see them again, 
you still have one link with an unsaved loved one. You have a dead wife, dead husband, God forbid, a dead child, dead parent, who is a Christian, a committed Christian, a saved Christian. You have one link. You can talk to Jesus and they can talk to Jesus. You can't talk to them, but you can talk to somebody they can talk to. That's the one remaining link you have with a deceased loved one who is a believer until the resurrection. Okay? You're never completely cut off. You have one link. There's one link. You can talk to Jesus, they can talk to Jesus. And they can talk to him better than you, they're in his presence, but the Holy Spirit's in us. We have one link. Only Jesus can cross that barrier by the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus crosses that barrier. There's no other way to cross that barrier until the resurrection, okay? Necromancy is a satanic counterfeit. But we have a unique case with Saul where God did allow Saul to go to this witch and Samuel did come back. It really was Samuel. There have been a few times in the Bible where God did send people back from the dead. Certainly. It happened on the Transfiguration. It certainly happened when Jesus died. Old Testament saints were seen walking in Jerusalem. There are a few times it happened. But those were the exceptions. With the occult, you cannot bring somebody back from the dead. God has to allow it or cause it to happen in some way. These people have familiar spirits. You know, Catholics will go on in a novena. How many people here used to be Catholic? You know, they, thank you. <laughs> Again, commiserations. St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless cases. <laughs> it's a hopeless case, it's the church that has the novena. But what are they doing when they go to St. Jude? Well, this is necromancy. They're calling on the dead. What happens when somebody kneel, kneels before a statue and an imitation of the Hindu practice of Vishnu counts prayer on beads? The Mary. This is necromancy. They're calling on spirits of the dead. Jesus is alive. You can't talk to a dead person. You only talk to a living person. He's risen. Now, it's interesting that Catholics have him back on the cross, hanging dead, crucifix. He's not on the cross anymore. He's risen. You understand? It's a, again, the occult will always go fundamentally contrary to the Word of God. And Catholicism is filled with the occult. And even more so, the Greek Orthodox Church. Also, Hasidic Judaism, with its Kabbalah, is loaded with occult belief and superstition. But let's continue. Those are the Hebrew, the main Hebrew terms. There are others, but those are the main ones. Hebrew has one general term, but there are different variations of it. Greek is different. These are the main, the main Greek terms. Episcanon. Episcanon. You foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Episcanon, in its ancient Greek origin, means to put the eye on. Like the evil eye? To put the eye on. And it brings about something in Greek called mesmero. We get the word mesmerize. What episcanon is, is hypnotic induction, hypnotic induction. How do they get people to fall down when they blow on them and all this and all the shaking and all? This is hypnotic induction. It's hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. That's what it is. I have the skin on. Okay? That's what it is. Of course, in the Bible, when people were slain in the spirit, 
For instance, it was a once-in-a-lifetime life-changing event. These guys get back in line. Right? They want to go down again and again and again. In the Bible, people were terrified. Jude, Daniel, they, uh, John, they were terrified. Right? John was in the spirit of the Lord's day and he fell as a slain. He was terrified. God had to send an angel saying, don't be terrified. These guys seemed to love it. The people had the real thing, were terrified of it. God had to encourage them. In the Bible, it was a once-in-a-lifetime, life-changing event. It doesn't matter what happens when somebody goes down. It matters how different is their life when they get up. Well, the people who are always going down, their life doesn't change. Remember the kid, the demon kept throwing him into the fire? And the power of Jesus came on him and they thought he was dead, and then he got up again? His life was totally different. In the Bible, when it happens, it's totally different than 99.9% .9 of what you see today. One difference is, in the Bible, whenever it was really of God, and somebody was favored of God, they fell forward. For the Hebrew word, uh, to worship, they fell prostrate in an act of worship. They went forward. The only time they went backward in the New Testament is when they came to arrest Jesus. It was a judgment. Yet Rodney Howard Brown and Hinn and these guys have catches with them. Oh, I know it's of God. Well, if it is of God, he's angry at you. You're going the wrong way. What you're seeing is epistanon, hypnotic induction. Remember, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign. I recall I was in Toronto, Canada for other business, but when I was there, I went to the lunatic asylum with the cross on the roof down by the airport, the vineyard place where the thing was. And the people, none of them, there was a lot of people, none of them were talking about Jesus. They were all talking about experience. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. That's what this is. It's wickedness and adultery. That's what Phil Pringle promoted in this, in this city. Wicked, he, that man promotes wickedness and adultery, according to what Jesus said. Ebiskanon. It's just hypnotic induction. Stage hypnotists do the same thing. Now, the vineyard movement were pioneers at manipulating Christians with this. You create an atmosphere with the music. It's like aromatherapy. You, you, you create an artificial environment that will soothe people. And that's what Sood's saying is, you know, <laughs> Sood's saying. Episcanon. Now, in Episcanon, you use visualization. You use things like you visualize, you picture. That's what happens in hypnosis. Another word in Greek you have to episcane on is this word. One most people would recognize. Pharmakia. Pharmakia. Pharmakia is the use of potions compounds to induce some kind of hallucinogenic or transcendental state. Pharmakia. It's also the word used in Revelation. The cup is filled with the pharmakia. If you're like me and you were saved out of the hippie thing, you probably took LSD and so on, and you realize that when you take LSD or psilocybin or mescaline, you take these hallucinogens, you enter the spiritual realm through another door other than Jesus Christ. There's an occult power to these drugs. You open yourself up to something very demonic. You're entering the spiritual realm through a door other than Jesus. Pharmakia. And it's no coincidence that even prescription drugs are widely overprescribed and misused in Western society. Even modern hallucinogens like cannabis are dangerous. They have an occult power to them. It's almost certain that the Delphic Oracle and the ancient Greeks used hallucinogens. People have done it for thousands of years. It was done by the Indians in Latin America. It was done in Asia certainly was done in Greece. Pharmakia is another word. Another Greek word found in the book of Acts used in connection with Simon Magnus. Now Simon Magnus was a much bigger deal than the book of Acts gives you the impression he was. The book of Acts is accurate what it says about him, but when you read history or you read Eusebius, he was worldwide. He was really, a, he was the origeller of his day and then some. Simon Magnus. And 
Today, Simon Magnus, when he, when he became a Christian, he tried to engage in the sin of simony. It's named after him. He tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit for money. And of course, he was cursed by the apostles until he repented. You know, I, I have actual advertisements by the American heretic Morris Cirillo. He's saying when the Toronto thing happened, he was charging 65 English pounds to come to his conference. 65 English pounds. You know how much it does in your money? It's like $200. Uh, plus all the offerings and that. And, you know, for 65 pounds, you will be assured your part in the great move of God. Cirillo will lay hands on you and you'll get this. When he didn't fill up the arena in Earl's Court, London, he put the Holy Spirit on sale. The Holy Spirit was marked down to 25 pounds. Open simony, open simony, promoted by a backslidden cult in England called Elam. It used to be a Pentecostal church, now it's a cult called Elam. The Elam movement, he just promoted them in their magazines. They promote open simony, open simony. No qualms about it. They kept promoting Cirillo, even though he was engaged in open simony. It comes from Simon Magnus. The word used there with him is existomai, existomai. Existomai literally means to cause to stand out, to cause to stand out. And its meaning is to seduce, to spiritually seduce with magic, to seduce with magic. This is what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do, that you read about that are read in the Oliver Discourse and in Revelation 13, and they're alluded to in 2 Second, uh, Second Timothy, they're going to use pretended signs and wonders like Pharaoh's magicians, like Jonathan Jambres, to seduce people, to seduce people into thinking they're of God. Now, a lot of these guys are just con artists. It's leger de ma, it's whatever, it's hypnosis. If somebody can't see through an obvious heretic, an obvious conniver, if you can't see through a Benny Hinn or a Kenneth Copeland, you know, if you can't see through Marilyn Hickey and all that nonsense, what's going to happen when these two guys come? <laughs> if you can't see through an obvious deceiver, you're not, you're not going to have a chance. They won't have a chance. If you can't see through the obvious, you won't have a chance. But we've mentioned that enough in the past. Exist am I. With this background in view, and this is just in a nutshell, we have longer versions available on tape. Turn with me, please, to the classic story of how the occult infiltrates God's people. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Then Samuel said to Saul in verse 1, <clears throat> The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Listen to the words of the Lord. Or the Hebrew, the sound of the words. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the sons of Israel when you came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. The Kenites were Gentiles who through the faith of Caleb came to believe in the Jewish God and they were spared from God's wrath. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he captured Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people, notice it was Saul and the people, spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. 
How does witchcraft work when it comes into God's people? Notice, first of all, Saul. Get rid of him completely. Look for no good where God says there is no good. Now, it says, but the people spared what was good. Oh, there's good things in Amalek. Oh, there's good things in Mormonism. Oh, there's good things in the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, there's good things. Anything that is good is camouflage. As we often say, there's always real cheese in a rat trap. Anything to be found good is only there as camouflage to ensnare you and get you in the trap. Look for no good. Amalek was their ancient enemy, going back to Moses. But he was also their future enemy. Saul was a Benjamite. To understand the book of Esther, we have to understand this book. Amalek and Agog, Agog was the king of Amalek. The Amalekites and the Agagites were the same people, okay? The same. Agog was the king, and the, they were later known as Agagites, named after the king, but they were the Amalekites, Amalek. In the book of Esther, Haman, a major type of the Antichrist, was an Agagite. Because it was a Benjamite, Saul, who failed to get rid of Agog, it had to be a Benjamite who did get rid of him. That's why Esther and Mordecai had to be from the tribe of Benjamin. You understand? They had to be from the same tribe. But that was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. In Persia, your ancient enemies will always be your enemies. Okay. Islam will always be the enemy of Christianity. Always. Talmudic Judaism, which rejects Jesus as the Messiah, will always be the enemy of Messianic Judaism, Jews who believe in him. Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy will always be the enemies of the gospel-believing church. Always. Your ancient enemies will always be your enemies. Oh, there's some good in it and we can... Well, it says there's some good in it, but God says get rid of all of it, the good and the bad. Look at us. When you're born again, you co-die with Christ if you're really born again. When somebody dies, do only their bad points die or do they die? The way God deals with our sin is he deals with the sinner. God doesn't try to get rid of our sin. He gets rid of us. He makes us a new creation. You're never going to get rid of somebody's sin by getting rid of their sin. You're going to get rid of their sin by getting rid of the sinner. Everything goes to the cross, our good points and our bad points. Only once it's been to the cross can God begin to use our good points and the power of the resurrection. But everything has to be crucified. Look for no good, no good, no good. Paul says, no good thing dwells in me. Anything is tainted with sin. Your good points are corrupted by your bad points. All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, a polluted garment. Don't look for any good point. It all has to be crucified. It all has to die. The whole thing is uniformly no good. The old creation must die. End of story. Not just the good points. Not just the bad points. All of it. It all must die. Well, why? Because anything that's good there will only masquerade what's wrong. Who are the hardest people to see get saved? Prostitutes? No. Drug addicts? No. Gamblers, no. Alcoholics, no. Criminals, no. Who are the hardest people to get saved? Religious people. Oh, they do good works. Their good points masquerade their bad ones. I'm not a sinner. Oh, he's such a righteous man. Oh, Mother Teresa was a wonderful person. Mother Teresa was a wonderful... Yeah, before she died, Mother Teresa, as we pointed out in Melbourne, Mother Teresa said... She doesn't convert people to be better, to be, be Christians. She converts these people to be better Hindus and better Muslims. How do you convert somebody to be a better Muslim? Give them a hand grenade? <laughs> uh, that's what she said. She picked them up on the streets of Calcutta, cleaned them up, and sent them off to hell in a laundry chute. 
Go to hell, go directly to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That was her gospel. Well, her, look at her good points. Yeah, it masqueraded the bad points. She was sending people to hell without Christ. Look for nothing good. Where well, God says there's no good. There is no good in man. We are fallen. There's no good in any false belief system. It's all bad. Anything good is to be gotten rid of with the rest of it. But the people and Saul kept the good things. They looked for good things. But what do you see today? Get a copy of the Martyr's Mirror or the Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Roman Catholic Church, not the people, but the institution, is your enemy. Either the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, or you atone in purgatory for your own. Either salvation is by the new birth or it's by sacraments. Either the Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ or the Pope is. You cannot believe both. You can either be a Catholic or a Christian, but you can't believe both. Am I saying that there are not true Christians in the Catholic Church? If they are true Christians, they will do what Jesus said, come out my people. If there are true Christians in the East Greek Orthodox Church, they will come out. If there are true Christians in the liberal Protestant churches, they will come out. Come out of her, my people. doesn't say they're not his people, but because you are mine, get out of it. You can't stay in that thing. You can't stay in the Catholic Church any more than you can continue to get drunk or take drugs or be promiscuous. You can't stay in a Catholic church any more than you can stay in a massage parlor. In fact, the massage parlor, at least, is not claiming to be Christian. Witchcraft. So he looks for good where God says there is none. Step one of witchcraft is always compromise. Compromise. Verse 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Here it's Devad Adonai. This is a Christological encounter. It's Jesus coming to him by the Holy Spirit. Today, on the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit is for all who believed. Under the law, it was only for certain people at certain times. High priests, kings, prophets, judges, patriarchs. Only certain people at certain times had the Holy Spirit. But as king, he was, a king was anointed. Okay, the Hebrew word Mashiach. There's many Messiahs, many Mashiachs, but only the, Jesus is HaMashiach, the Messiah. But he was an anointed one. He had the Spirit. Okay. I regret I made Saul king, for he's turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night to turn. You've got to understand the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for repentance is Teshuvah, Teshuvah. Teshuvah means to turn from sin towards God. It's not saying I'm sorry, it's a life that shows repentance. Because repent means to turn. You turn from the way you're going to another way. Backsliding in Hebrew means you turn from God back towards the world. <laughs> repentance is you turn from the world towards God. That's repentance. You turn from the world towards God. You make a turnaround. Backsliding is you turn from God back towards the world. Now notice how this happens. He did not carry out my command. Backsliding never begins, never begins by doing something we shouldn't. It always begins by failing to do the things we should. Once we begin to chronically fail to do as we should, it's inevitable we're going to wind up doing something we shouldn't. You understand? Backsliding doesn't begin by doing something we shouldn't. That's how it ends. That's the result of backsliding. Backsliding begins failing to do what we should. Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You stop walking in the Spirit, you're going to sin anyway. The devil doesn't have to tempt you to sin, he just has to just suggest it. You're going to do it anyway. What he has to tempt you to do is get in the flesh. Once you're walking as an old creation, think you're going to sin anyway. Me too. Okay. 
stop reading the Bible, you stop praying, you stop fellowshipping with other Christians, you stop sharing your testimony and giving the gospel, you stop doing the things we should, it's inevitable we're going to wind up doing things we shouldn't. Backsliding does not begin by doing what we shouldn't, it begins by failing to do as we should. But God called Saul the backslider right from day one. You see people who for no good reason are not in fellowship? It says in Proverbs, the backslider of heart will be filled with his own ways. <laughs> What's the backslider? There's as many backsliders in the church as there are outside. The epistle of Jude deals with the subject of backsliders in the church. That's what it's about. And it describes, it describes the way they behave and the way they operate. Backslider and heart will be filled with his own ways, we read in the Old Testament. They fail to do as they should. If you don't do what the Bible says you should, it's only a matter of time before we begin doing something we shouldn't. He compromises. So he's already backslidden. A lot of people who compromise are really backslidden. Now some may do it out of ignorance, but I've met people who know things were wrong and they compromised. Why? Because they're backslidden. The worst example of this is what happens to people in leadership. When instead of the Hebrew word, of course, or in the Greek word, the Hebrew word for pastor and shepherd is the same word, Ro'e, Adonai Ro'e, the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd, a pastor, is a, is a shepherd. But Jesus said, there's a difference between a shepherd and a hireling. A hireling, it's his job. He's hired. His priorities are his salary, his position, his, his standing in the community, his credentials with the denomination, his housing allowance, his pension. Not the sheep and not the word of the Lord. He's a hireling. I had a meeting in Melbourne, Australia once with five Pentecostal ministers, four of them assemblies of God, one apostolic. These are people who I'd spoken in their churches in previous time. They all liked me. But they knew that Philip Powell and myself opposed the laughing, drunken thing. And they said, you can't do this. This is of God. Rodney Howard Brown is sent to Australia by God. I showed them videos of Toronto and of Rodney Brown. I said, can you defend that? None of them could defend it, but they still supported it. Because the people wanted it. They were hirelings. They're not passive. They're hirelings. They're backslidden. They personally know it's wrong, but they'll still compromise with it. They know it's wrong, but they'll compromise with it. You see, people and, and churches stay in denominations that will ordain homosexuals. Well, we don't do that in our church. But you're part of a system that does. Why, why don't you either stand up and fight it or stand up and leave? Why do they compromise? Compromising is the first sign of a backslider. You want to find the backslidden leader? The first symptom of a backslidden leader is a compromiser. It is also the first step towards witchcraft. Now second, look what happens. The word of the Lord came. I regret I've made him king. He's turned from following me. Verse 12, and Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Then he turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Second step of witchcraft. They set up monuments to self. They set up monuments to self. A big danger in the last days is what Jesus warned about, that he was in the field not go back for his cloak, the mantle of authority, like Elijah and Elisha. When the work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work, look out. We are called to build the kingdom of God, not the empires of men. But it's very easy to confuse the two. For instance, if God says get a building, get a building, and if God says get a thousand buildings, by all means get a thousand buildings. If God says. You see these building programs that are, people are building monuments to self? There's one in Northern Ireland. The guy teaches the myth of British Israelism. He apparently denies the Trinity. He's from a oneness background, and he's refused to solidly re reject the denial of the Trinity. He's again part of this Elam cult. 
And he took me around his church when it was brand new, and he was showing me they had, they had these Ming Dynasty things and plush carpets and crystal chandeliers. He's showing me the place. Architecturally, it was impressive. The Mormons do the same thing. They show you a beautiful building. The Catholics do the same thing. They show you a beautiful building. Every false religion will show you their architecture. They try to compensate for what they don't have inside with what they have outside. <laughs> it's like embalming a corpse. You can make a corpse look almost alive, but they're dead. <laughs>